morning and welcome again to our Sunday morning worship service here at Red Mountain Baptist. Uh, we're excited that you're with us this morning. We're, uh, we're, we're hopeful that uh, these days are growing shorter and that our time together will, will come soon as we can be back in the Lord's house. But we know that the people are God's church and any way we can get together and worship the Lord, we're thankful for that. So thank you for being with us this morning. I want to share some scripture with you from Proverbs chapter 18, verse 10. It says this, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and it's safe. So as we worship together today, remember that. God is there to protect you and keep you safe. And he wants you, he wants me to run to him for shelter. So what a great God we serve who loves us in this way. Let's worship and praise our great God who is our strong tower. And as we go to prayer time this morning, I want to praise God for you. I want to praise God for how faithful you have been. And Pastor Dave wants to praise you for this too. Yeah, you, you've given in your tithes, your offerings, your building fund pledges, and your Annie Armstrong offering for North American Missions. And it's so vital because it lets us continue to be able to do the mission work and ministry support that we are doing. So we're so thankful for that. And pray this morning that God will use your faithfulness and generosity for His glory and for the advancement of His kingdom. And also, uh, as we go in prayer, we want to continue praying for all those who have been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, those who have COVID-19 in their families, families who have lost loved ones, families who have been infected by unemployment, wisdom for governmental leaders as they open the state back up, and our church leaders as they are working on a reopening plan. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you for this time that you've given us to be together this morning. We know with what's going on, Lord, it's easy to get lost in the day-to-day things that seem like they're out of control, Lord, but we know that you are in control. We know that you're a great God, and you tell us to come to you, to seek shelter with you, Lord, and that you will always take care of us. And Lord, as we're working forward to getting back to as close to normal as we can, we know that we rely on you to show us how to do that. We ask, Lord, that your wisdom be with those that are having to make decisions about when and where to do these things. We ask, Lord, that you be with everyone that is working or has been affected uh, by this COVID pandemic. Lord, that we know it's, it's many people that it's uh, affecting just in our country, if not worldwide. We know that, but we know that you're in control, God. We know that you're there, and we know that we can rely on you, and I pray that you'll give peace and uh, just the sense of healing and of love that you can bring to these folks during this time. We pray all this in your precious son's name. Amen.
you, Wally and Sammy, for that beautiful song. Aren't you thankful that we have a God who is so faithful that no matter what we face in life, we can continue to praise Him because He is faithful to us. And uh, speaking of Wally and Sammy and the Watson family, I uh, just want to just give you an update on baby Charlotte. We want to thank you for praying for, for baby Charlotte and all she's going through and praying for the Watson family. Yesterday, she was five months old, so that's a huge milestone. So thank you for praying for her. And uh, we continue praying for her, continue praying for the family. Uh, and we just want to praise the Lord. In case you haven't heard, plans are being made for her to leave the hospital and come home, which is a huge step uh, for baby Charlotte and for the Watson family. So be praying for them as they get ready for that. Now this week, there's some things going on to get her ready for coming home. She's going to be having a procedure this week, surgery, to place a more permanent IV in so when she does come home, the family can give her the nutrition that she needs until that uh, bowel block that she, that she has clears up. And there's a lot of prep work going in as she gets ready to come home. The family has to go through a lot of training, so just be praying for them. They're doing some CPR training this week. And just getting ready for her to come home is an exciting thing, and they're getting ready for that. So let's continue praying for baby Charlotte and the Washington family. And I also want to ask you to pray for Wade Ellis. Uh, Wade is going this Tuesday for an echocardiogram on his heart. Uh, he's been having some issues, and he's getting that checked out. And then he's scheduled Wednesday for heart catheterization. And if there's anything they need to address, they'll address that in it. then, maybe put a stint in if they have to. But be praying for Wade and Garnet and the Ellis family as well. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the opportunities to come into your house to worship you today. And we give you praise and glory that you are a God who is faithful. You're a God who, who is there for us in the hills and valleys of life, Lord. And, and we can continue to praise you no matter what we go through because you are solved. You are in control. And you, you have a purpose for our life. And you're growing us into who you want us to be, to be more Christ-like. And Father, we thank you that you know exactly what's going on in our lives. Father, we thank you for being with baby Charlotte and the Watson family and all they've gone through these past five months. What a huge milestone to celebrate her, her fifth month birthday yesterday. We just give you praise for that. And now plans are being made for her to come home. And that's exciting. Another huge step in her life and for the life of the Watson family. We just pray that her surgery go well to put this uh, more permanent IV in. There'll be no complications. There'll be no issues, Father. And we give you praise, Lord, for bringing her through that surgery. <clears throat> and we just pray also that you'd be with the family as they're getting uh, prepared for her to come home. Lord, we just pray uh, for the CPR training to go well. We just pray for, for all the prep work to go well, Father. There'll be no complications with that, no issues. And the right time, she can come home. And you just continue to watch over her and watch over the family, Father, and take care of them and use us any way we can just to minister to them. We also lift up to you Wade Ellis as he's been having some issues with his heart. Uh, we just pray as he goes this week to have an echocardiogram and then a heart catheterization done. That uh, those test results will show what's going on. And if there's anything that needs to be addressed, Lord, that you will address it in the midst of that procedure and cause him to feel better, Father. And just uh, protect him, Lord, and just take care of him and be with him and guard it and trace in the family and give them a sense of peace that you're going to take care of. Him. And Father, as we look into your word this morning, we just pray you speak to us uh, from your living, powerful word. We ask this in your name, Lord. Amen. If you would take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 is where we are today, and uh, I want to talk to you about the issue of pain. Uh, you know, sometimes in life, we really don't like to feel uh, pain, do we? No one enjoys pain. We don't like to, to handle pain, and sometimes we don't handle the pain of life and suffering life very well. We don't even like to be discomforted at times. Uh, we, we like everything to go our way, to be, for life to be easy and to be covered all the time. Let me give you some examples of uh, how people show they don't like the issue of being discomforted. These are some actual responses that people wrote on comment cards at a, at a park that was a, a natural park in the mountains. And this is ways they said they can improve their experience at the park. The first one says this, trails need to be wider so people can walk while holding hands. Another one says, trails need to be reconstructed. Please avoid building trails that go uphill. Now remember, this is in the mountains. Uh, too many bugs and leeches and spiders and spider webs. Please pray. Please, please, excuse me. Please spray the wilderness to rid to rid the areas of these pests. Please pave the trails so they can be snow plowed in the winter. I like this one. Chairlifts need to be added in some places so that you can get to the wonderful views without having to hike to them. The coyotes make too much noise last night and they kept me awake. Please eradicate these annoying animals. And here's another good one. A small deer came into my camp and stole my jar of pickles. Is there any way that I get reimbursed for that? Reflectors need to be placed on trees every 50 feet so people can hike at night with flashlights. Escalators would help on steep uphill sections. 
A McDonald's would be nice at the trailhead. Now, here's a, here's a nice one here. Uh, the places where trails do not exist are not marked very well. And then uh, uh, here's the, the best of all, I think. Too many rocks in the mountains. You know, we don't like to be discomforted in life. We don't like to face suffering or unneeded pain. And we're not fond of it. We're not even fond of this, a little bit of slight of discomfort. And we rebel at the suggestion of pain. We, we, we recoil at the sight of it. We reject any suggestion that it may be good for us and help us become a better person. But the lessons of life that we grow in and how we become who God wants us to be are often taught in the classroom of pain, often taught in the classroom of suffering. Whether it's uh, something that you have to deal with in school or if it's something you have to deal with in, in, in real life, maybe facing a disease or maybe, maybe facing the grief of losing someone that you love dearly. I mean, let's just think about our situation today. Many of us are dealing with the suffering, the discomfort, the pain of this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it may be something physical. You may be sick with a virus or know someone who is sick with a virus. It could be emotional because you're just worn out from, from everything that's, that's totally different for these past couple months. Uh, being at home all the time and, and your schedule being totally messed up. And this, the stress of the situation. It could be something financial. Uh, maybe you're, you're suffering right now because you've been furloughed or you lost your job. Or your spouse has lost their job. And there's so many forms of pain and suffering that people are facing right now. So what I want to dive into this morning is how to deal with pain. How to deal with pain. What does the Bible say about dealing with pain? So let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning there in verse 7. It says, Unless I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses. For Christ's sake, listen to this, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Father, we thank you for your living, powerful word. And Father, I just think that the people that are watching today, many of them are facing some type of suffering, some type of discomfort, some type of pain in their life. And they may be asked that question, how do I deal with this? And Lord, I pray as we look into your living, powerful word today, you show us how to deal with the pain of life. Give us truth in your word that we can apply to our life. And we pray you'll be glorified by it. And I ask Holy Spirit you to speak to our hearts and preach through me. We ask this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. You know, as we look at this passage of Scripture, there are several truths that I want to point out to you that, that tell us how we can deal with the pain of life, some things that we need to realize in our life. Now, this first one really is not mind-blowing, but it's just something we need to be reminded of. The first thing is pain is a part of life. Let's just be honest. Pain is a part of life. You know, from a logical point of view, it would seem that, that maybe God will reward those who, who, were, who are doing good with less pain. You know, Lord, I'm living for you. Don't I deserve less pain? We might think that way. Or some people might think, well, you know, think about people that have given, sacrificed so much like missionaries, yet they suffer and they go through pain. God, don't you want to you know, take care of those that are serving you and give them less pain? We may think that, that way, but that's not the way the world works. That's not the way the life works, is it? You know, as a reality, pain is a part of life. You know, the Apostle Paul who wrote this passage of Scripture, he served the Lord with his entire life. And after he got saved, he was so devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ, and yet he experienced great suffering in his life. He experienced great pain in his life. In fact, as, as, as he said about planting churches, he said about reading, uh, reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, reaching the Gentiles, a great uh, evangelistic movement, uh, to, you know, he did it with incredible pain. This one chapter previous, in chapter 11, it kind of gives his resume of suffering and the things that he went through. I mean, he spent multiple times in prison. He was beaten. He was flogged. He, he had some life-threatening experience. He was stoned. He was shipwrecked. It tells us that he spent a night and a day floating in the open sea. He didn't always have enough food to eat. He didn't always have enough sleep or enough clothing. Or, and he didn't always have the friends for the support that he needed. He'd been chased by bandits. He had been chased by religious leaders that didn't agree with, with his teaching. He battled temptation like we battle temptation. And he battled anxiety over his, the churches that he planted, of, of what he was going to do for his, the Jewish churches and how he could help those churches. But the Apostle Paul has a long resume of suffering. He has a long resume of, of pain that he dealt with in his life. 
And now here in this passage we're looking at today, it says that he had a thorn in the flesh. How bad was that particular pain? We don't know exactly what it was. We, you know, there's speculations about certain things. But how bad was that pain? Well, look at where it says where this pain came from. Basically, this pain was straight from hell. That's how bad it is. If you look at the passage of Scripture, it says that it's a messenger of Satan that was sent to torment him. Perhaps, maybe you have felt that way. That excruciating pain. Maybe going through the, the, the treatments of, of cancer. From what I understand, those can be painful at times. Or maybe it's some kind of terrible disease that you or your spouse, your loved one goes through, something like Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS. Or maybe it's, it's an older person that has, their body is just wrapped with arthritis. And they're facing this pain, they're suffering. Or somebody that has been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Or any other number of diseases that we could face in life. Any disabilities or, or things that come along our way that discourage us. We face pain like the Apostle Paul faced pain. All that he went through. And yet... Now God allows this thorn in the flesh to come into his life. And Paul asked God to remove that pain. He realized pain was a reality of life. And he asked God. He went to the right source. He cried out to God. You know, whatever it may be. And Paul asked God. Maybe he reasoned with God. God, if you remove this pain, maybe I can plant more churches. God, if you remove this pain, maybe I can, you know, do more for the kingdom. God, if you remove this pain, maybe I can write more letters in the New Testament. But God saw fit to allow this thorn in the flesh to stay in his life. Again and again, on three separate occasions, Paul pulled out all the stops. And he asked God, God, please remove this thorn. God, please remove this suffering. Remove this pain. But the pain didn't go away. That thorn did not go away. Whatever that thorn was, it stayed with Paul for some time. And maybe even the rest of his life. The thing about the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus knew pain, didn't he? Jesus knew the emotional pain of, of having someone that he loved to die as he wept at the tomb of Lazarus. Jesus knew spiritual pain as he, as he looked over the city of Jerusalem and he wept because of their spiritual condition. Jesus knew physical pain, didn't he? Think about all he went through on the cross of Calvary for us. He knew the pain of betrayal as his disciples turned their backs on him when he got arrested. He knew the pain of rejection, the pain of, of disappointment, the things that we've experienced. Jesus knows what pain's like because he's been through it. You know, it seems silly to make a case that pain is a part of life, but we got to be reminded of that sometimes. As tough as this pandemic has been on, on people, I understand there's a different level of toughness. It depends on what you're going through. But all of us are suffering to a degree because of what we're facing. But pain and suffering is a reality of life. Somebody put it this way. Basically, life starts with a good slap in the baby's bottom. And in some aspects, it's downhill from there. You know, we know... Pain is reality of life. But here's really the important question as we think about the reality. Will you find the positive in the midst of your pain? Will you find the positive in the midst of your pain? Paul did, and you can also. Perhaps maybe you already have. How God is using this pandemic to bring out good. As we stop and think about how God is watching over us and caring for us, yes, this pandemic is terrible. A lot of people have lost their lives. People have lost their, their jobs. There's been a lot of bad going on, but there's also a lot of good that is happening. The gospel is being spread around the world like never before because there's churches like us that have a presence online now sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And God is using the gospel being spread to reach more and more people. More and more people are searching for a relationship with God. They're searching for hope. They're searching for answers and they're turning to Jesus to find that. That's the positives in the midst of pain. As we think about the reality of pain, it kind of leads to our second truth. We have to realize that if we're going to deal with our pain, we have to realize there's a purpose to our pain. You see, not only is this pain part of life, but, but secondly, there's a purpose to our pain. Now this point of theology can be really tough to, to accept sometimes. It can be a hard pill to swallow. And, and there's a fine line here that, that should be crossed because we need to be careful in, in how we address this topic because we don't want some people who are in pain to, to suffer more pain because of the way we, we deal with them. We must never casually explain to someone's pain or suffering, well, oh, that's just part of life. You know, uh, you know, the Bible does tell us that God won't put on us more than we can bear. Would you realize when people say something like that, that is taken out of context? That passage, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, is not talking about dealing with pain. It's not dealing with temptation. That's what it's talking about. We need to realize there's a way to deal with this biblically. Instead of this idea, you know, you know, being used in someone else's life, we need to look at using our life. 
What's the purpose of the pain in my life right now? What's the purpose of the suffering, the discomfort that I'm going through? Kind of do a self-study. Because you see, in the midst of this pain, you know, we, we discover that this pain has a purpose. You say, I don't understand how this pain could have a purpose. Well, we know in the book of James, it tells us that one of the purposes of trials that we go through, or the pains that we go through, is to mature our faith. James 1 tells us that in the first couple of verses. To make us more mature in our faith. To make us more Christ-like, if you want to think about it that way. You know, there's lessons that can be learned in the classroom of suffering that you can't learn anywhere else. And, and honestly, it's in those valleys of life, that, that suffering, that pain, that you get to know God in a way, in that valley, that you won't get to know Him on the mountaintop of life. So there's great things that can be learned through suffering. And there's a purpose in the pain. As we look at this passage we just read, Paul basically concluded you know, for himself that this thorn was meant to keep him from being conceited from what he's experienced, his revelations that he's experienced. That he wouldn't get puffed up and prideful and this thorn in the flesh was meant to, to protect him from that. And since we know so much about Paul's life and his work and his suffering, let me suggest some, some positive purposes of some of the pains that Paul experienced in life. In Philippi, Paul and Silas, you remember, they were beaten in public and they were taken and thrown into jail. Now, these are men, uh, you know, they were probably the, the headline of the day, if you want to think about it that way. You know, all of Philippi had heard about them, what they were doing. They had come to preach about the Messiah, and they were punished for it. They were beaten, they were thrown in jail. But imagine the headline the next day when they heard what happened that night. It's Paul and Silas. Yes, they suffered, and they were thrown in jail, but they began to sing and praise God. And there was that earthquake. And remember what happened? The jailer came to know Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. During the beating the day before, can you imagine? Maybe they're, maybe they're praying out to God, crying out to God, God, please make it stop. Bring some type of relief. But no relief came. But because of the suffering they went through, the gospel was shared and the jailer was saved and his family. And the gospel was spread. The relief didn't come, but there was a purpose in that pain. I think about it in Ephesus. Paul, you know, might had probably his most successful ministry there in Ephesus. He was preaching there for, for almost two years until, you know, those who lived in that province of Asia, they heard the gospel. But then all of a sudden, things just began to change quickly. As quickly as you can incite a riot, things changed for Paul. Thousands of people gathered together in what you might call the local theater. And, and they screamed in their disapproval of the message that Paul was preaching because it messed with their pocketbooks. He was preaching against the worship of Artemis. It was one of the most important financial economic supports of that city at that time. But they didn't like that. So in that riot, most of the people, they weren't even sure what they were there about. They were just following the mob mentality. They didn't know what the fuss was about. What would we do in the hours that followed such an event? Would we want to know what caused such a fuss? Paul didn't get to preach to that crowd that day like he wanted to. But thousands heard by Paul was there in the message he was preaching. Think about it. He'd given years of his life there in Ephesus, and all of a sudden he's basically running out of town, having to leave the ministry behind in a hurry. Like Paul, perhaps most of us, maybe we can't see the purpose of the pain right away. But in the midst of suffering, it's extremely difficult sometimes to see the purpose of that pain, to celebrate that purpose. We have to trust God that He has a purpose for the suffering we're going through. You see, the only way we can do that is by faith. To know that God is in control. To know that God has allowed this for a reason. In the midst of pain, there's, there's an opportunity for our, for our faith to grow, as I already mentioned from James chapter 1. For us to become more Christ-like. And, and sometimes our growth is accelerated in the midst of that suffering. Our growth is, is accelerated in the midst of that pain that we're facing. That God is allowing this suffering life for a purpose. And we may say, Lord, I don't know what the purpose of this pain is, but I trust you that you have a purpose. And I know one of the purposes is that you're going to grow my faith. You're going to make it more Christ-like. Think about Joseph from the Old Testament. Joseph went through a good deal of suffering, didn't he? I mean, from Joseph's point of view, there was, there was a time in his life where it seemed like everything was just falling apart. It started when his brothers, who were jealous, sold him into slavery. Remember that? And then he made his way, and his, his employer, Potiphar's wife, accused him of, of rape, falsely accused him. He was thrown in prison. Made some friends in prison. And when his friends got out, they forgot about Joseph. Maybe he felt like that he was being ignored by God. That God had previously had, had given him these visions, these dreams. That one day he would be in a position of leadership, in a position of power. Did God forget him? 
Joseph was about 16 or 17 all this, all this time when it began to happen. But how many years of suffering went by before he understood that God was doing something? One thing about the story of Joseph, you go three, through and read it, that it says the Lord was with Joseph. Wherever he was, the Lord was with Joseph. God was working in the midst of his suffering. God was working in the midst of his pain. You know, we can tell his story like I did very quickly in a minute or two. But for Joseph to go to live it, that painful process was very slow. Perhaps 10 or 15 years or more. That's a long time to be waiting on God to do something, isn't it? That's a long time for God to relieve your suffering. To be sitting in parked in a dead end street and nothing happening, just waiting on God. But as it turned out, God wasn't doing nothing. The whole time he was working behind the scenes. God was working in Egypt to set things up for Joseph to come into power. God was working in the weather pattern. Just say how. Remember the famine that came and, and, and Joseph prepared Egypt and then it drove his family to him. God was working behind the scenes. God was working the lives of his family as well. But most importantly, God was working in Joseph's life. He was preparing Joseph. He was testing him. He was, he was probing him and forming this young man. And there's such a godly man where his faith in God would not waver. Even if he was in the bottom of a dungeon, he trusted God. Just like he trusted God when he was in that position of power and prosperity. But make no mistake about it, as God worked, the waiting was still hard for Joseph. I'm sure it was. Bitterly hard. Life may be tough for you right now. But rest in this truth. God is working behind the scenes. God has a purpose for the suffering and the pain that you're going through. You may not see it right now, but knowing God's track record, He's not wasting this time. He's allowed this for a reason. When we realize that God has a purpose, it helps us to better deal with the pain we're facing. That it's not just pointless. But I want at least for our final truth that we have to realize, and that is this, there is strength that is available in the pain. There's strength to build on the pain. God doesn't expect you to go through this on your own. He wants to be that strength and provide that strength you need. In this passage of Scripture, Paul receives a special message from the Lord Jesus Christ. Look what he says there. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. The message and the messenger gave Paul a tremendous boost. It encouraged him. Perhaps we should, we should notice, I should note to you how, how Paul didn't hear from, from the Lord, you know, like this every time. You know, you think about, well, Paul, you know, he was saved on the road to Damascus. That must be how his experience was all the time with the Lord. Not, a, not according to the history of the Apostle Paul. I mean, think about it. You know, according to, to Bible scholars' timelines, that uh, Paul was saved uh, just several years after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. It was a miraculous experience, as I said, there on the road to Damascus. I mean, complete with blinding light, that thundering voice of the Lord Jesus. It sent Paul into three days of repentant fasting. But just a few weeks after that, Paul had another supernatural experience there in Jerusalem. And when he saw the Lord speaking while he was in this, in this trance, and, and there Jesus told Paul to take the message of the gospel to the Gentiles. Now remember, Paul was a Jew. This was a major shift in missions. To go from the Jews to the Gentiles. Before this moment, Paul wouldn't even probably share a piece of old bread with a Gentile. But now, God is calling him to take the message of hope, the message of life to the Gentiles. But 16 years at least passed before Paul had another one of these recorded experiences. Think about it. Two miraculous experience encounters in a matter of, of just a few weeks. And now 16 years have gone by before he had another one of these experiences. And after that next miraculous message, it would be another six years at least before the next one is recorded in the book of Acts. And then according to Acts, there wasn't another one. I think it's fair to say for, for most of Paul's pain, for most of Paul's suffering that he went through, it appeared that Jesus didn't show up miraculously to relieve the pain and suffering, did he? I mean, here Paul, you know, was serving the Lord Jesus Christ, yet he went through suffering and pain. I think about Peter, the leader of the New Testament church. You know, he went through suffering too, and he didn't have this miraculous relief of pain and suffering. I think about Stephen. Jesus showed up at the end of Stephen's life when he was about to die. Remember that? He was being killed for his faith, and he saw the Lord Jesus Christ. 
You know, none of these New Testament heroes had a, had a personal experience of the Lord every time they went through a beating. They didn't have a personal experience of the Lord every time they went through uh, you know, rest and, and suffering and pain. They must have suffered a great deal in relative silence. And maybe they wondered, God, where are you in this? Why would you allow this to happen? When Paul kept asking for his thorn to be removed, he got a direct lesson. He got a direct message from the Lord Jesus Christ. He got the strength he needed. See, whether God shows up or not, He's available to give us the strength we need. And Paul knew that. Look, at, look again at what our passage of Scripture says there, beginning in verse 7. I just want to read through the whole passage again. Unless I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn of the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of this, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in, in distresses for Christ's sake. In other words, he's saying, when I go through for Christ's sake, I take pleasure in Why? Look what he says, for when I am weak, then I am strong. In other words, Paul decided that it was fine for him to go through pain. Why? Because Christ's power, Christ's strength was upon him in the midst of that pain. He gave him, Christ gave Paul what he needed to keep going. And he offers the same to you today. He wants you to do what Paul did, to cry out to him for the help you need, to cry out to him for the strength you need. And you can say like Paul said, when I am weak, then I am strong. That strength is available and the pain that you're facing today, that same strength is available in the suffering you're going through today. I, I can tell you I've experienced this strength time and time again. Back in February 2014, my dad died unexpectedly. It was a shock to us. There was no health issues indicating that he was going to die. Just, he, the Lord took him home one night. And this is the passage of Scripture I preach at his funeral. I've shared this with you, Red Mountain folks, that, that the day of his funeral came and, and uh, you know, it was a very emotional time, as you can imagine. And we were singing a song, and I forget the song, but I just know I got a picture in my mind of Dad singing that song in the presence of Jesus. And my emotions got all over me, and I was just a sobbing, snotty mess. And I was next to get up and preach this passage of Scripture. Now I was sitting in the front pew with my family, and and, and I began to cry out to God like Paul did. Lord, I need your strength. I need you to help me. And the church that Dad's funeral was in, the platform is a little bit taller than this platform. It had about five or six stairs going up to it. And the whole time I'm just thinking, I can't do this, Lord. There's no way I can do this, Lord. I need you to, to give me your strength. I am weak. I need your strength. As I climbed each step, things got better. By the time I got to the top on the platform, God just took over and preached through me. That is God's strength when I am weak. And that's the same strength that's available to you. I don't know what you're facing today. I know some of you are facing because I've talked with you. i prayed with you about the things you're facing. But know that same strength that God gave me back on February 14th, 2014. That he gave the Apostle Paul in the midst of this thorn in the flesh. He offers to you today. It's available to you today. And he wants you to cry out to him. And turn to Him for strength. You don't have to go through this alone. You don't have to deal with this on your own. You're not alone. God loves you. He proved His love for you that He sent Jesus Christ to die for your sins. That's how much God loves you. He went through great pain. So you wouldn't have to spend eternity in pain and torment. He gave His Son for you. Who took your sins on Himself. And paid the punishment for your sins at the cross of Calvary. He was buried and He rose again the third day. And through a relationship with His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, when you confess your sins, repent your sins, and you give your life to Jesus, you can experience the same strength that I've experienced, that the Apostle Paul experienced, and that and Christians, countless Christians throughout the ages have experienced. But here we realize this pain you're facing in the midst of this trial of life, this pandemic, whatever it is, God wants to give you the strength you need to proceed through. God has a purpose in your pain. And God has the strength to offer you. But He just needs you to cry out to Him like the Apostle Paul did. You know, I think about a pearl. You know, a pearl is a beautiful piece of jewelry, isn't it? You have a string of pearls or pearl earrings. 
They're not cheap. They're pretty. But do you know how a pearl came to be? It began with just a grain of sand. That tiny sand slipped into the, the seal of an oyster shell. shell. It began to irritate that oyster as that tiny sand had slipped its way in. And immediately that discomfort came that oyster, and that oyster began to produce this, this layer of, of lining from inside the shell to cover that irritant that was causing so much discomfort because it couldn't get it out. And over time, that, that oyster began to produce more and more layers time and time again because it could not expel that grain of sand. You know, as far as the oyster is concerned, what we call a pearl is nothing more than great suffering that it went through. But one day an oyster is fished out of the ocean. It's opened up and that gem inside has amazing beauty. It holds great value. You go buy some real pearls today, they're not cheap. And it's all because that oyster had great suffering. Now maybe it's no accident the 12 gates in the New Jerusalem in Revelation 21 are made of pearls. It's the suffering of our Lord Jesus Christ that allows that gate to be there in the first place and we can enter into the glories of heaven. And all who enter those priceless gates, we know what it is to suffer, don't we? What pain are you facing today? How are you dealing with the pain of life? Yes, it's reality of life. We know that. But it's not here by accident. God has allowed it for a reason. He has a purpose in your pain. And He wants you to trust Him. He wants you to reach out to Him. And let Him use His pain to mold you to who He wants you to be. To be like His Son, as Romans 8, 29 tells us. To be conformed to the image of His Son. And that starts by doing what I said earlier, placing your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Maybe that's the first step you need to take in dealing with your pain. Is you need to come to know Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior. You need to repent your sins and believe in who Jesus is and ask Him to save you and give your life to Him today. Maybe you've done that. And you have a relationship with Almighty God through Jesus Christ. Just because you have a relationship doesn't mean you're not going to experience suffering. doesn't mean you're not going to experience pain. But God has a purpose for this pain. For this valley you're walking through. To grow you into who He wants you to be. To who He, he wants you to become who He created you and saved you to be. To live into His purpose for your life. And part of that is we go through the valleys. So we become more Christ-like. But understand, remember, you're not alone. God loves you. He's there every step of the way with you. And he wants you to cry out to him for the strength you need. We don't know how long this pandemic is going to go on. We don't know how long states are going to be closed, how long it's going to take to reopen. I don't think we'll go back to normal the way it was before this started. There'll be a new normal. But what I do know is this. God's given you the strength to go through it. And God has given you the strength to face the pain in your life. I pray you'll cry out to him today for the strength you need. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you that you showed your love to us by sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. Lord Jesus, that we don't have to pay for our sins because you already did it. Thank you for going to the cross for us. Take it on my punishment. Take it on the punishment for, for the sins of all of mankind. And yes, you died and you were buried, but praise God, you rose again the third day. Proving you are the Son of God. Proving you can do what you said you can do. And you're offering us everlasting life. The ultimate pain that everyone's going to face one day is the pain of hell. But we don't have to because you're offering everlasting life. You're offering a relationship with you, a relationship with your Father. You're offering us heaven. You're offering us your Holy Spirit to fill us here and now. And all we need to do is confess our sins, repent of them, and cry out to you for salvation. Give our life to you to be our Savior, Lord. I pray for those that are watching that have never done this, that today will be the day of salvation for them. They'll take that first step towards you and experience that everlasting life, Father. Father, I pray for Christians that have already done that. I, I thank you they've done that. Lord, we know as Christians, we're not exempt from pain. We're not exempt from suffering. We're not exempt from the discomfort of life. And it's hard at times. 
but you are offering us your strength and reminding us there's a purpose to what we're going through. So I pray we will cry out to you. Lord, in our weakness, you will make us strong. As you did for me many times, Father, especially on that day of my dad's funeral, when I needed you so much, I cried out to you in my weakness and you gave me your strength. You just took over. And I thank you for that. And I thank you that I've experienced that time and time again before and since. And Father, I just pray that we will cry out to you for the strength we need to endure the pain we're facing. It could be physical, it could be spiritual, it could be emotional, it could be financial, it could be so many things that we are suffering from. But we, you, you have not left us on our own. You want us to cry out to you. So, Father, I pray we do that today. Thank you for offering us your strength. Thank you for being available and reminding us. Yes, we face pain, but you have a purpose for this pain. That you are molding us into who you want us to be. That you saved us and you created us to be. To be conformed to the image of your Son. Remind us of that constantly, Father. And as we were reminded of that, and as we cry to you for strength, we can deal with the pain of life. And we thank you and praise you for that. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for worshiping with us today. And as we close out our service, there are a few announcements I would like to share with you. If you're a guest joining us today, we would love to connect with you. And we can do this if you just go to our website at www.redmountainbaptist.com. Click on the Contact Us tab and fill out the form so we can con connect with you that way. Also, Graduation Recognition Sunday is June the 14th. It's coming fast, and we want to honor all of our graduates. If you or your child is graduating from high school or college, please contact Pastor Dave so he can get some information from you so that we can honor and uh, just see these folks that have put all the work in for their graduation and honor them to do that. Also, as you know, our Baptist women are making masks for people to have during this pandemic. So far, they have given out over 100 masks to our members, first responders, and businesses in our community. If you need one, please contact Tracy Humphreys or Kim Pearson. And if you need their info, please contact Pastor Dave. He will be glad to get that to you. And we pray that you have a great week. And remember, if we can serve you in any way, please do not hesitate to contact us. Thank you, guys. Look forward to seeing you soon.